All right, now time to get to the Betway playoff preview. I'm Anthony Lyman from 92.3 The Fan in Cleveland, and I'm joined alongside my partners for this broadcast today digitally. Uh, that would be Jason Lloyd of The Athletic. Jason, how are you? Great, Anthony. Uh, good to have you, as well as your colleague, uh, Joe Varden, who's done a, a ton of coverage this year surrounding the NBA. Uh, Joe, welcome to the show. Great to be here. All right, well, let's get to it. Uh, you two know this series that we're going to talk about to kick it off uh, more than just about anybody in the country. The upstart Knicks with a great rebound year and the Cavs. Uh, they have been a delight. Uh, one of the great young teams in the NBA, and they're sitting there with a fourth seed and home court advantage. Uh, Joe, I'll start with you. Uh, first of all, home court advantage. Does that mean anything in this series, knowing how good the Knicks are on the road, but how good the Cavs have been at home? Yeah, and the Cavs stink on the road, so let's start with that. I think the the headliner in this series is Donovan Mitchell. He thought he was going to the Knicks. By all rights, he should have been going to the Knicks. The Knicks ultimately couldn't get that done. They, they wouldn't pony up what the Utah Jazz were looking for in late summer. Donovan ends up in Cleveland, and in my opinion, he just changes everything for this franchise. It was a team that had made some strides last year, fell off late, and up until the, the Donovan Mitchell trade, we're coming back with really no differences um, in, in an East that had gotten a lot better. Mitchell shows up. He has the game of the year by all accounts, 71 points. Uh, he makes them way more dynamic on offense. He's brought a certain confidence and a certain attitude to the way that they play. He's on my ballot as a first teamer for all NBA because of his the impact that he had, uh, I think the Cavs won five or six more games during the regular season than they did last year. And he was their only addition. So you can look and say that, uh, that he was worth the six wins. So, um, I think you start there. He's from New York, greater New York. Uh, he, he will be motivated, I guess, to beat his hometown team. Uh, I think that goes without saying, and, and he's looking to, um, you know, he he was a Cavs fan. Donovan Mitchell was he he loved LeBron when LeBron came to Cleveland. And so he understands the history, but he also knows that he has a chance to be the author of a, his own Cavs chapter. And, and he already did that with the 71 points, the however many games that he had, I think it was 11 or 12 that he, he scored a 40 or more that, you know, that hadn't been done here. So. Um, he's writing it. He wants to continue to write it and, uh, and beating the Knicks in the first round will be, uh, the next step there. All right, Jason Lloyd, uh, the Knicks are an underdog in this series. Cavs minus 215. neither team with a lot of actual playoff experience. So how big of a factor do you think that will be in this series? Yeah, both teams are going to rely on their veterans and for the Cavs, that means, Donovan, obviously, as Joe was saying, this team goes where Donovan and Darius take them. They've been guard dominant all year long, and those two have the ball in their hands on almost every possession. And, you know, the other guy, I, I've been I've been saying it for weeks now, I really think Danny Green's going to have a big role in this series for the Cavs, and he's a guy who's hardly played at all. And, uh, obviously, he was a buyout. They picked him up at the after the trade deadline, wanted him for his veteran experience, his ability to shoot. And I, I just think you can't play four on five in a playoff series. When the when the game slows down, the Cavs play at a slow pace to begin with, and that grinds even slower in a playoff series. We all know that everything really turns into half-court sets. And if you have a guy in the corner who the other team doesn't respect, and I'm talking about Isaac Okoro, he's, Okoro's had a great year for the Cavs shooting the ball, but teams still don't respect him enough to guard him. And they, too often they're playing four on five on the offensive end of the floor. And it's going to be too hard to score that way. It's going to be too hard for the Cavs to, to get baskets that way. So I absolutely think Danny could play a big role. Just, just being able, just being a threat out there that the Knicks have to be aware of and know where he's at on the floor at all times. Uh, you know, I, I do think the Cavs being so young, being untested, being the fact that this is their real first playoff experience, you know, how will they handle a hostile environment? How will they handle something like the garden? I think it's unrealistic to think that they're going to hold serve and win four games at home. Uh, I, I just think the Knicks are probably going to steal one in Cleveland and, and now you have to go to the garden and win. And, you know, the, it, it's not so much, it's just, it's just what a hostile environment it is. We saw it with Boston a couple of years ago when a Cavs team. And I, I think outside of, of LeBron, the talent on this team, I think is better than what the Cavs had in 2018, but you saw a team with a lot of young guys 
really struggle in a, in an environment like in Boston, they lost the first three road games and then they relied heavily on LeBron, obviously in game seven to pull them through. And you could have a similar type scenario here where if you got to go to the garden to win a game, that's where Donovan's really going to have to deliver for this team on the road in a hostile environment. Uh, you know, this is the first time, how's Darius Garland going to react to a, a playoff setting? How's Evan Mobley going to react with the ball in his hands? Uh, so there's, there's a lot of unknowns on both sides. The Cavs to me though, are the more talented team. I do think they're more talented. Uh, I think I would probably, I don't know how you don't give the coaching edge to New York right now at this point, just because it's Tom Thibodeau. He's one of the best defensive minded coaches in the league and JB just hasn't been there before. And, you know, I would argue that you could have said the same thing though, in 2016, when it was Ty Lue against Stan Van Gundy with the Cavs in the first round and everyone would have given the nod to Stan Van Gundy and Ty Lue is spectacular. And, and that's what we need to see. I think out of, out of JB Bickerstaff, that's what I'm curious to see is how does he handle uh, after timeout situations coming out of a timeout when you've got to have it. And, you know, it, you're on the road and the Knicks just scored eight straight, you call timeout. Now you what's your inbounds play. And where are you going to go to and what's going to get you a basket to quiet down the crowd, to kill the momentum, to get you back on board. And that's the type of stuff that we have to see. JB's never been in that position. And so this is a real test for him, not only for the players, but also for him. All right, but gun to the head, you got to make a choice. Uh, are you going with the home team? Is that going to be the edge in a potential game seven for the Cavs? I think it's going seven. I think it's going six or seven. Like it's going to be a grind of a series. I, I, it's hard for me to pick this. It's really, really, really close. Uh, I guess I would give the edge to the Cavs because they would be at home for that game seven if it gets to seven. But boy, is it close. Like, I don't have a good feeling about this either way. I, I don't, I think the Knicks are a really hard matchup for the Cavs in the first round. And I guess I would take them since they're the home team in a game seven. But to me, this is a coin flip. This is probably, I think, the tightest series of all the first round matchups. There are two significant injuries in this series. Isaac Okoro hasn't played in weeks because of a knee issue. If, and in fact, the last time the Cavs saw the Knicks, Okoro wasn't on the floor and Jalen Brunson lit them up without him. So if Isaac can't play at all because that knee, Jason's right, he is an offensive liability, but they are shredded when he's not out there on defense uh, at all. So, you know, we don't know how, how healthy he's going to be. And then the Knicks best, best player or their second best player or best player one a Julius Randall also hasn't played in a couple weeks because of a severe ankle sprain. He practiced today. He didn't take any contact. I, I expect that he'll be out there, but those are two pretty big wild cards. I, I do like the Cavs in this series. I, I actually say, I'm going to say it's a six game series, which of course means it could go seven, but I just think the Cavs are a little bit more talented. Um, they have the best player in the series and they have that extra game at home. And I'm with you, Joe. I think Cavs in six, uh, they better win game one. Uh, we say that all the time, big playoff series, but all that pressure would, of course, uh, be right squarely on the backs of a very young, inexperienced Cavs team. We remember what happened with Jalen Brunson when he was in Dallas just a year ago, outplaying Donovan Mitchell over the course of the series when uh, Luka Doncic was dealing with an injury. So they can't let that happen. Cavs cannot uh, get stung there in game one, but I think they'll be okay and I think that home court will serve them well, but they will close it out on the road in game six in New York. Let's get to our broader Eastern Conference preview as it's been a, an interesting season. We know that the Boston Celtics got off to the great start uh, to kick things off. We know that Milwaukee did not have Chris Middleton for most of the year. Then he came back and he was hobbled again and still doesn't seem 100% healthy, but Giannis getting through the playoffs. And then, of course, we know about Philadelphia uh, having a terrific year. And Joel Embiid most likely winning the MVP. Jason, I'll start with you. Who is your sleeper team in the East? And is that even possible to have a sleeper team come out of the East, given everybody is either penciled in Boston, Milwaukee, and maybe a few have penciled in uh, Joel Embiid and the Philadelphia 76ers? Yeah, I don't think it's a sleeper. I like Boston to win it all this year. I thought they should have won it last year. Uh, the one wild card, you know, we talk about Jamie Bickerstaff being a, a rookie head coach and going through this for the first time. You could say the same thing about Boston and Joe Missoula. And again, coaching matters so much in the NBA playoffs and in those moments where you got to draw up a play, where you got to have it, where they take away your number one, your number one weapon, where else do you have to go? But I just like Boston's wings, how athletic and interchangeable they are. And uh, 
probably the experience of getting there last year and not getting it done. I think this is the year that they do it. Giannis is the best player in the East. Boston to me is the best team in the East. And I think Boston wins it. Uh, Joe, a sleeper. Is there a potential of that even coming out of the East? If you consider Philadelphia a sleeper, then, then sure. I mean, they, the Sixers are as deep, we're close and and about as good, I think, in 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 several aspects as either of the top two contenders. You know, you you consider James Harden to be probably an all time great, and Joel Embiid to this point in his career has been a dominant player when healthy. They have PJ Tucker, uh, they have Tobias Harris, Tyrese Maxey is a is a really fun up upcoming young player. Um, but then when you start considering track records, you know, James Harden shrinks in the playoffs. Is that going to happen now? Doc Rivers is, has, you know, he's, he won one title uh, with the, with Boston a number of years ago. He struggled in the playoffs. Joel Embiid, his body usually breaks down in the playoffs. So it's, can this team that's so deep, can they get past the track record? I don't, I am concerned about Chris Middleton. The last game that the Bucks cared about at all, uh, the, you know, late, late last week, Middleton was removed from the game with knee soreness. Um, th- his, his bad leg last year wrecked their playoff hopes. And they, they are a different team without him with, you know, he is why they, they were able to win the 21 championship, um, with how good he was in the conference finals against, against the Hawks and, and sort of, you know, kept the ship afloat while Giannis dealt with an injury. Um, they need him and he's, he's not a hundred percent. So that opens the door for a sleeper like, like the Sixers. Um, and also, you know, I agree with Jason in a lot of ways. I, I love Boston. I think they're a great team. Uh, I, I don't know about, should they have won it last year? I, I thought, you know, kind of like the Warriors did in, in 15 to Cleveland, the Warriors figured out that series and, and shut down, um, you know, Tatum and Brown or made it, made it a lot harder for them in games five and six. But I think they come back stronger. Um, so in the event that Chris Middleton's leg is no good, then, yeah, you, you certainly look to Boston. All right, so let's let's put it in bold. Your pick to go to the NBA Finals at the Eastern Conference is? Celtics. And, Jason, Boston. you're sticking, sticking with the Boston, Boston. Celtics. Yeah. All right, beautiful. So let's get over to the West, where uh, I want to talk to you, Jason Lloyd, about your sleeper team because you have already mentioned – the Los Angeles Lakers, and we know that LeBron's missed 27 games. Anthony Davis has missed 26. Their record, 17-9 and nine since the trade of Russell Westbrook. We're talking about a team that uh, is no stranger to championship aspirations. They've come through in the past. You think they could go through that gauntlet and stay healthy enough because that is the big factor there in getting all the way. Yeah, I don't think the West is actually that much of a gauntlet. And, you know, LeBron has said throughout his career, I don't care about seeding. Records don't matter. Just get me in and I'll handle the rest. Now, that was prime LeBron, you know, four, five, six years ago when he would talk like that. But this will be the ultimate test of that because I do think they could run the table in the West. Memphis, obviously, we know about the problems that they've had uh, with John Morant and some of the off-court issues and and the the just the uncertainty of that season of – that whole franchise really. And Denver is the number one seed, obviously Nik- Nikola Jokic uh, worthy of where he's at could be a three-time MVP, fantastic player, but I don't look at that as a team that LA can't beat uh, the, really the team that I think could give them the most problems in the West is Phoenix, quite frankly. So I do think uh, mm-hmm. LA, if you're looking for a wild card team, if you're looking for a team that could run the table uh, and surprise some people. I don't know how much a team that has LeBron James on it could be considered a surprise, but given where they're at in the play-in tournament, where they're starting from, I absolutely think that they could be a team that goes on a deep run here. Joe, he mentions Phoenix. Uh, they've won 10 straight when Kevin Durant is actually in the lineup. And Kevin Durant has been so good this year. If you combine his records with both, uh, when he's actually on the floor with the Phoenix Suns and the Brooklyn Nets, He's won 21 of 22 games, but is there enough chemistry there? Could you see Phoenix coming out of the Western Conference? I absolutely could. I think, I mean, this is a strange, bold statement I'm about to make, but when he is on the floor, Kevin Durant is probably still the best player in the NBA or or is the best player in the NBA. 
but he doesn't get that moniker at all because he never plays. He played in 47 games this year. Um, but he, I don't think the Suns have lost when they have him actually in uniform and on the, on the floor. Add that to Devin Booker, Chris Paul, you know, DeAndre Ayton is there. They were able to acquire Durant without trading him. So they are deep. They are good. They are very good. So I think that's an obstacle. Another obstacle in the Lakers way, and it's hilarious to say that, you know, we're talking about obstacles for a seventh place team. Um, but the Clippers under Ty Lu have beaten the Lakers 11 consecutive games. Ty, who of course was LeBron's coach in Cleveland when they won it all, uh, knows how to draw up a game plan to, you know, you don't stop LeBron, but to mitigate the resources around him. Um, that would be the, that's who the Lakers would see in a finals either or in a Western conference finals, either the Clippers, the Suns, or the Nuggets. Um, assuming the Nuggets get past the first round, which we think they will. The Nuggets remind me of the Hawks in 2015 and then also the heat uh last year and the hawks were were dumped easily the second round that year by the Cavs and lebron just tore, tore them up the heat are a little different though the, the heat were basically wire to wire first place team last year i mean you know they're, they're give or take but but they, they spent a long time in first place last year Went in as the number one seed, got no respect whatsoever, and were one shot away from going to the finals. The Nuggets have dominated the Western Conference this year. Dominated. They are much healthier than they've ever been with uh, with Jamal Murray and Michael Porter Jr. They have Contavious Caldwell-Pope, who has entirely changed them. He is a 3 and D uh, you know, wing. He has won a title with the Lakers. Uh, he can be that gritty physical defender that they've lacked. Um, and they are getting absolutely no, no respect. So I think we need to stop and consider that this second round matchup, I'll say it's between the Suns and the Nuggets. I think that's going to be a hell of a series. And, you know, th there's a chance that, that, uh, that the Nuggets are right there in the, at the Western Conference Finals. All right, let's crystallize your pick then to get out of the Western <laughs> Conference. And we know a lot of parity right now in that conference. You just don't know who's going to be healthy enough to get through that journey, which we know can be uh, such an obstacle for certain guys at this stage of the game. So who do you got? I've got the Suns. I'm definitely with Jason that the Lakers could do this, but I, I, I'm just concerned about Anthony Davis and staying healthy for that long. Um, and so – I, I, I feel better about Durant uh, just in a playoff, playoff setting. So I will go with the Suns. All right, and Jason? Oh, I've talked to the <laughs> Lakers so much, and I'm going to drop them at the, at the altar. Uh, I, I like the Lakers to get to the conference finals, though. I do think, I think LA can get there. I don't think none of those teams really scare me, not even Golden State, Memphis. You know, I think they can handle those teams, but I, I do think Memphis – probably is just a little bit too deep and too talented Memphis. Uh, I'm sorry, Phoenix takes them in the conference finals, but I like a Phoenix Lakers Western conference finals. And I'll say golden state. Uh, I just think while Wiggins is going to have some rust and Peyton, they're going to have some rust over the next few weeks. They just have to get past Sacramento. Sacramento has not been tested. It's been a great year by Mike Brown and the Kings, but I do think the Warriors have the better setup to actually being able to get to the Western conference finals. And once they're there, I mean, Who's picking against Steph Curry in a best of seven? I mean, you could argue Steph Curry is having the best season of his career right now at this age. And I I just think their, their system, the way it's set up, they've coasted all year. They haven't even bothered to uh, pretend to be engaged on the road. That all changes once the playoffs start. And I think a healthy Wiggins is going to be a big deal. By the time we get to the Western Conference Finals, Wiggins will be in midseason form. So I am going with the Golden State Warriors. So you guys have matched them up on both sides of the bracket. Uh, Jason Lloyd, uh, recap your two recap your two teams and talk about the potential matchup, uh, what that could mean in the NBA Finals this year. I got Boston against Phoenix. I like the Celtics to win it all. I I just I'll take the team uh, that to me is a little bit better defensively, can switch on anything. Uh, 
Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum, obviously Marcus Smart. The only question for me is how will Joe Missoula handle his first run, uh, his first postseason run? And there will be moments where Boston's got to have it from their head coach. And uh, more than maybe any other sport, I think coaching matters in the playoffs in the NBA more than the NFL and, and baseball and hockey. And it's where guys can really make their mark and really make a difference. I like the Celtics to win it. I thought they should have won it last year, and I think they get it done this year. Uh, they have been almost unbeatable when Robert Williams is actually on the floor. They're like two different teams when he is there versus when he's not. Uh, so how big of a factor could that be? Because you brought up the defense. They can switch every screen. Uh, they, they really get at it. They can be physical. And again, I think the Celtics, even though with their great record, I feel like they kind of coasted at times through the season with their new head coach. Well, you could say about every team in the NBA, every team coasts. It's the 82 game curse at this point where, you know, teams play hard for about five minutes tonight and for about six weeks during the season. And that's about it. And you could say every team has their moments where they just coast. That doesn't really bother me. Nobody's coasting at this point. All right. And give us, I know it's very far out, but people are going to want to know because they want that juice. They want to be able to take advantage. Your MVP of that potential NBA finals. Lay all on the line right now, Jason. Oh, give me Jason Tatum. <laughs> Tatum in That's, a Celtics victory. Listen, Tatum was maybe one of the front runners in the first month of the season for NBA MVP. Things kind of faded at times uh, during the year. He kind of lost his shot. Uh, but I think that is a really, a really good pick and one that if you could somehow get a future on that right now, you'd be good. All right, Joe, uh, recap your teams going to the NBA finals and how you think that matchup will play out? Well, I want to start by saying that up to this point, before we talk about who's going to win the finals, that Jason and I have actually been in lockstep. Now, he and I are very good friends. We've been close for a long time, but we did not talk about this at all. No. At all. There has been no coordination whatsoever. And, you know, we I think we we spend a lot of our days like working on different things. So like these are two totally different angles that we're coming from. And we see it the same. Like we both have Boston getting through in the East. We both have the feet have the Phoenix suns getting through in the West. But as I'm sitting here and I'm thinking this through uh, as far as what happens in a finals between those two, Anthony, as you said, when Robert Williams is on the floor, the Celtics are awesome. It is because they can switch one through five, not one through four, one through five. Uh, and the other reason, along with Williams being being so good at that, is that the the uh, the decision by former coach Ime Udoka last year to start Marcus Smart at point guard unlocked their pressure defense, uh, unlike all, virtually anything that we've seen in the modern era. And they, the, just the way they can blitz, the way they can do all the different things with, with Marcus Smart out there is truly scary. The yeah, but here is we are assuming that Kevin Durant is healthy and leading a Suns team in the finals. And in a finals, there's no player currently in the NBA, not even LeBron, which is almost blasphemous for me to say, but there's no one I would rather have than a healthy Kevin Durant. I watched him put Team USA on his back in the, at the Tokyo Olympics in a game that they should have lost to France. They didn't lose because Kevin willed them through. He, he is the best player in any situation that he's in, so long as he is healthy. And so if I'm going to put these two teams on the floor together at the same time, and I'm acknowledging that the Phoenix Suns are no pushover as is, and complimentary players like Devin Booker alongside him, if given the chance, I, I think Durant would find a way to get it done. So, you know, it's not, it's not a perfect science by any stretch, but I'm going to split with my good friend here, and uh, I will say the Suns get it done behind Durant. All right, good stuff. And uh, even though I teased before saying if Philly could make it, I do not think Philly ends up uh, getting to the NBA Finals. So uh, I'll go with both of you. I do think the Boston Celtics are coming out. I just cannot trust uh, the Milwaukee Bucks and uh, their their situation outside of Giannis. And uh, I have them, you know, going up in the NBA Finals against the Golden State Warriors. And this time, I do think they exact their revenge. And I do think it is going to be uh, Jason Tatum. Uh, able to pull it out and get the NBA MVP. I think it'll be a dogfight of a series, but I just think that added edge of 
having to taste defeat. We remember how that worked out with the Miami Heat and the San Antonio Spurs and what happened when the Spurs went on their revenge tour and they dissected uh, that LeBron, Wade, Bosch led Heat team. And then it caused LeBron. It was so bad that LeBron ended up leaving and going back to Cleveland. So in this case, I don't know if that'll send the Golden State Warriors into a tizzy and uh, forcing him to make some tough decisions on Draymond Green and maybe Klay Thompson, but uh, it'll have some reverberations. And I think uh, that in the end, it'll be the Boston Celtics holding the Larry O'Brien trophy. Where we go over the awards and uh, some of these are gonna be very interesting. I wanna start out with you, Joe Varden, the rookie of the year. Uh, people thought this was going to be a runaway with Bancaro uh, for a while. And then Jalen Williams, one of the two uh, Jalen Williams out of Oklahoma City, and obviously Walker Kessler starting to uh, get some a little bit of momentum. But is it enough? Uh, Bancaro is a huge, huge favorite for Rookie of the Year right now. No, it's Bancaro. I don't mean to be so dismissive, yeah. but he's he's going to win. Yes, yeah, some he of said the shooting that wrapped numbers. Up for mine. Yeah, Sorry. feels that I, way. I, I, yeah, this this was decided. I feels to me like by January the rookie of the year race was over. Defensive player of the year. Now this is interesting because if you would have said uh, Evan Mobley a month ago, Jason, uh, I think people around the NBA would be like, "What? Cavs were not on national television a bunch." Uh, some of the metrics, some of the advanced metrics, while the Cavs do have the number one defense in the NBA. Uh, did not have Evan Mobley at the very top. And part of it was they have another big-time rim protector, uh, obviously, that got a lot of the love. The Cavs were actually pushing for Jared Allen uh, the first two months of the year for Defensive Player of the Year. Now, is there enough momentum for Evan Mobley to be able to steal this award as a sophomore, which would be an incredible accomplishment? Well, my my guy over there has a vote and voted for for Mobley, and yeah, I think that there's uh, I think there's a, a real chance that that, that happens. Uh, you know, you mentioned Jared Allen; it's interesting because Jared is sort of like a tentpole to everything that the Cavs do, and in the games where Jared misses, it just feels like everything comes crashing down. So that would bode well for a case for Jared Allen for for Defensive Player of the Year. But it's I like the Mobley pick. I think it's deserving. I did not have a, a vote. If I did, I probably would have voted for Evan. Just his ability to guard multiple positions, his body control, even last year as a rookie, the way that he can control his body and the way that he can alter shots, and the way he can block shots without fouling, uh, just a, a real weapon and a force and a huge reason why the Cavs do have the best defensive team in the league. And I think it's only going to go up from here. Like, you know, when they drafted him, I thought he was a, a potential number one, a future number one on a championship caliber team. And it's so hard to find guys like that. And, you know, would you like him to make more threes offensively? Yes, of course. Uh, and maybe eventually that will come. But in terms of his game now, you've heard the comparisons to Chris Bosh. I think that's accurate. Bosh was a great defensive player. I think Mobley is a fantastic defensive player and he's only going to get better. You know, it's only his second year in the league. And with the two of them together, they've got the Cavs already have Jared Allen locked up long term and to have him and Mobley together, they do feed off each other. Now, ultimately, will Jared Allen cannibalize some of the votes from Evan? Perhaps. But if you watch him play night in and night out and you watch the way that he can change a game defensively. Yeah, I, my pick for defensive player of the year. There's a lot of there's, there's a lot of worthy people. Uh, you know, Draymond Green obviously is in the conversation. Brooke Lopez to me is in the conversation. Jaron Jackson from Memphis. Uh, hasn't played a ton, but another terrific player averaging over, I think, three blocks a game when he's out there. But for for me, and not just because I'm in Cleveland, Evan Mobley would be my pick. All right, quickly, Joe, I know who you think should win Evan Mobley, but who is going to win quickly? Lopez. Brooke Lopez, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think it's going to be Jaron Jackson the third, despite only playing 29 minutes a game and amassing amazing foul trouble in each and every game. Almost seems like it's been a season-long campaign to get him that award. Uh, so that's why I'm going Jaron Jackson, the third out of Memphis. We'll keep our eyes quickly. We got to wrap this up with MVP. Uh, Joe, uh, did Joel Embiid, did he lock that in the last month of the year? This is going to be wild. Anthony, uh, I've seen some ballots. I've, I, I know who I voted for. I've seen four or five other ones and all three guys are getting votes, including Giannis. I, I know two people who voted for, for Giannis. Um, and so I, I I'm going to say it's Giannis Joker or excuse me, Joel, number one, 
he wins, followed by Joker, followed by Giannis, but it's it's going to be close. Jason? I'll take Jokic as the three-time, but I don't know how you can go. I don't know how you can argue any of them. Whoever wins this award, you'd be upset if it's not your guy, if it's not the bet that you placed. But I don't know how you could dispute whoever it is. Embiid, Joker, Giannis, all of them are worthy. All of them have great cases, and they're all fantastic players. And this could be the closest vote uh, that certainly I can remember, maybe the closest in history. Even though their season's still very much in play and they're hoping to make a big run in the postseason. Uh, Joe, you've been following this team uh, as they've come into relevance once again, uh, not just locally in Cleveland, but also nationally. What's the one thing uh, that surprised you about the Wine and Gold this season and what they were able to accomplish on their way to 51 wins? Oh, wow. Well, um, that the that feeling that deciding not to address the small forward position from outside the organization didn't sink them. I thought it would. Um, I don't think th- that we should expect the Cavs to make a finals this year. And so ultimately the, the, they'll come up one player short, um, but they were able to grow and they were able to improve with this hole that they had on the roster. So I think, that's the number one thing that surprised me and right behind that would just to watch Donovan Mitchell come in and in his first year in a new city, have the best year of his career. That's pretty cool. Jason, uh, a team that if you would have told me before the season, a four seed, I think you would have taken it. And that was before you knew about the Brooklyn implosion right in front of them. So uh, overall your takeaway from them getting to this spot, home court advantage in the first round of the playoffs. I thought their bench would be better and they've overcome that. You know, when we go back to the start of the season, if you look at a bench of, I mean, Karis Levert was starting it early in the year, but ultimately I think he was, I viewed him more as a bench player. And if you look at a bench by the end of the season of Karis Levert, Ricky Rubio and Kevin Love, you would have thought that's, that's pretty good. That's a really deep team and a versatile team that can play a number of ways in, in multiple ways. Obviously Kevin's no longer here. Ricky has struggled coming back from the, from the second ACL injury. And, and this just isn't a very deep team, but I don't think it's really going to cost them. When you get to this point in the season, you're playing eight and trust in seven. So, you know, you're not going to get very much barring injuries or foul trouble. You know, that eighth guy may only play seven or eight minutes. So you're really, you can get by with your five starters and two bench guys. So uh, it hasn't gone the way that, we thought it would, you know, Joe alluded to it. They had a massive hole at the three spot and, you know, Okoro has really sort of come into his own. He is what he is offensively. He's never going to be a 20 point guy. Uh, he has shot it a well from three, but other teams just aren't respecting it still. And so that's really, to me, that's all that matters, but he is terrific defensively. He could guard multiple spots. Uh, he has filled that role admirably. Um, I, I don't know. I still think that, he won't be much of a factor in the playoffs just because of the offensive liabilities, but just the fact that they sort of carved their own way and they didn't do it the way they got there, but they didn't do it the way that certainly that I thought they would. Again, I thought they'd be a little bit deeper. I didn't think that they'd have to rely on these guys to play as heavy of minutes as they have here lately, but they have, it's the route they've gone. They put the ball in Darius and Donovan's hands and they said, you're going to go, you know, you're going to lead us. And at times, I think it early on in the year, I think it stunted Evan Mobley's growth a little bit. He didn't get the touches uh, that maybe he would have in another situation, but he sort of figured it out as the year went on. And he he's getting to the point where we thought he would get to, but again, he sort of did it in his own time and on his own path. Uh, but this, this is one of the youngest teams I mentioned earlier, the Cavs and Thunder, two of the youngest teams in the league. And uh, only good things to come. No, I don't think they're going to be anybody's finals picks this year, but they could be as early as next year. I, I got to tell you, for me, it was just how dominant Donovan Mitchell was uh, getting off to that great start. The first 10 games of the season, first month and a half, then his numbers kind of regressed back to where he had been throughout his career. And then where he finished uh, four straight 40 point games, they needed every last one of those points. He almost seemed like he flipped the proverbial switch to get ready for the playoffs. I've been blown away. The 71 points, that was amazing. Uh, He's had, you know, clutch moments at times, and I think he's put the fear uh, into a lot of teams that uh, I don't care who is going up the Cavs on a nightly basis. They do not want to see Donovan Mitchell get hot from three-point range uh, back to 38% 
which was basically his career mark from behind the arc. So uh, for me, Donovan, I, I would I would think all of you would agree it would be Donovan Mitchell, the MVP, Jason, or do you think Evan Mobley's defense would give him the edge? For the no, team MVP's got, team MVP has to be Donovan and just the way that he's bailed them out. There's been so many games this year where nothing was working and Donovan just said, give me the ball and get out of the way and, and I'll take it from here. He's not in that class to me of, of the names that we're talking about earlier in MVP race. You know, he's a tier below that. But in terms of what this team needs, he fit in perfectly age wise, skill wise, talent wise, what they needed. Uh, he was a great fit to drop in. They gave up a ton for him, but they got out of him exactly what they needed to get out of him. Joe, are you in lockstep with your team MVPs at Donovan? Donovan Mitchell's on my MVP ballot, period. Um, going back to just what I said earlier, he, you know, he, you plug him in and they won six more games. Like the, the overall NBA award has taken on all these crazy meanings um, it's almost up to the interpretation of the individual voter as to what what me, what valuable means, but the actual literal definite definition of the word, applying it to the Cavs and and Donovan Mitchell, it's it's not close. I mean, so he you know he he uh, he gets a mention on my overall ballot. All right, well, what do the Cavs need to take that next step? Maybe not their final step, but that next step understanding that could be tough given no first round draft pick, not a ton of cap space. I don't think they need really, I mean, shooting, you know, they could, they need more shooting. They could use another shooter, but I think they have the pieces really. They just need enough. They just need to go through this. You know, this year has sort of, I've said this before, this year has sort of felt like repeating the third grade or it sort of felt like purgatory because they, they got to this point last year, they got to the play in tournament and then they missed out on that playoff experience. The play-in tournament is not the playoffs. It's not the same thing. It's not seeing the same team four, five, six, seven times in a row and having to figure out, hey, they blitzed us on the pick and roll. They're taking away our pick and roll game. What else do we have to go to? They missed out on all of that last year. So this year has sort of been chipping and putting, chipping and putting to get back to this point to now get them that experience. So once they go through this once, figure out what it's like. Once Darius Garland reacts to you know, turning the ball over late in game two and costing him a win. How does he respond in game three? Once he understands the environment of going on the road and trying to win a playoff game in a hostile environment on the road, that's what they're missing. It's not so much personnel or skill set. Other than, like I said, shooting, you know, I, I think that they could add some more shooting, but outside of that, I think they have the pieces that they need. Joe, is it just kind of that uh, linear development? That's what they need. I, I guess so. I, I'm still not sure that Isaac, who did get better, as Jason has said, I, I'm not sure that he's a championship player. He's got to earn that. He's got to show that. Um, whereas, you know, there are guys out there. Um, they exist, how available they are, what's their free agency status, whatever. Um, but there are players that, that you know, the Cavs could try to make a run for it to, to improve the three, the three spot. I'm also, I've been a little bit concerned and I was going all the way back to last summer when they did this about Ricky Rubio. Um, he, they love him in the organization. He's happy to be there. They love the impact that he had on their young backcourt when they had a young backcourt. Um, but he came back this year from, you know, his second torn ACL. He's in his thirties. That's a hard injury to come back from anyway. And, and he hasn't been the same player. Um, so they, Jason has said they, they've overcome a weak bench. Well, part of the reason that they've had a weak bench is they brought back a, a, a backup point guard who a, wasn't going to be able to play half the year. And then B when he came back was going to be limited because of surgery. So is he the answer next year when they're trying to go, go win a title? I mean, we'll see. Um, but, but that's another area that they could get better that you can upgrade your bench, uh, through, through free agency. 